Turn your Bibles to Joshua chapter 23. Joshua 23. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, didn't we do Joshua 21 last week? And you would be right. Doesn't that make it Joshua 22 this week? And you'd be right. The problem is I prepared Joshua 23 and skipped Joshua 22. <laughs> so I thought, I, I can't, I realized the mistake on the Saturday and I thought, well, I can't go back and try and do a new one on Saturday and do it all rushed. So we will come back to Joshua 22 and you will just forgive me and have mercy on me and just say, you know, the past is getting old. So Joshua chapter 23. After a long time had passed, and Yahweh had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua, by then old and well advanced in years, I can relate to that, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, officials, and said to them, I'm old and well advanced in years. You yourselves have seen everything Yahweh your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was Yahweh your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the great sea in the west. Yahweh your God himself will drive them out of your way. He will push them out before you and you will take possession of their land as Yahweh your God promised you. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with those nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. But you are to hold fast to Yahweh your God as you have until now. Yahweh has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of your routes, a thousand, because Yahweh your God fights for you just as he promised. So be very careful to love Yahweh your God. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that Yahweh your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which Yahweh your God has given you. Now I'm about to go all the way of the earth. You know with all your heart and soul and not one of all the good promises of Yahweh your God has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as every good promise of Yahweh your God has come true, so Yahweh will bring on you all the evil he has threatened until he has destroyed you from this good land he has given you. If you violate the covenant of Yahweh your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, Yahweh's anger will burn against you, and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we recognize that you are a God who is glorious in all that you have done. And when we read about the way in which you have acted in the past, in in history, how you have intervened, we are amazed at your power, at your glory, at the way in which you were able to drive out the nations from the land you gave to your people so long ago. We acknowledge that greatness in our midst this evening, for you are present with us. And we pray that as we spend some time wrestling with your word, that you would open our eyes. Oh God, we pray for a vision from you that we might hear your voice to us so clearly that all other voices may be drowned out and only your voice would remain. Speak to us, we pray, 
for we are needy people. We are dependent people. We look to you. We need you. And we ask that you would exalt yourself in our midst this evening. For Jesus' sake, amen. When I was much, much younger, and we really are going back now, one of the things I used to hate was cross-country. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not an athlete, so in, in, in the sense of running. I hate running. Anyone who runs, I'll take my hat off to you. Well done. I don't know how you do it, but it's incredible that you can discipline yourself to run. I think you're nuts, but nevertheless, if you enjoy it, then good on you. Well done. And we used to have this cross-country at school once a year when I was in primary school, and we'd run, I don't know if you could do this today, we'd run out of the school gates, and they had this course plotted out in the suburb, and you'd run around to a number of streets and then into some bushland, I don't think you could do it today, and then finally we would uh, come back towards the school, and there would be teachers allotted at certain points outside of the school that you would run past, and they would check that all the children had come past and I remember running this cross-country, cross just hating doing it. And we had one boy in our class who wasn't the brightest of boys. He had failed twice. Now, in those days, when I grew up, when you failed, you failed. You stayed behind a year. Today, they kind of push them through. And if you fail, you don't actually fail. You keep going right through school. But in my day, if you failed, you failed. And if you failed once, twice, three, four times, you failed. And this poor boy had failed twice, so he was two years older than everyone else, which meant he was two years advanced, and which meant that when he ran, he was way ahead of everyone else. And the year before, he had run, the, uh, run and he had won, and the year before, he had won again. And this was our final year. We were in year five, and he was uh, running, and he was leading the race by some distance. And as we got about two-thirds of the way through the gra uh, race, and I was somewhere near the back because I hated running, and so I was quite happy to be near the back, um, I, we, I ran, and there he was, sitting down under a mulberry tree, eating mulberries. And I said to him, what's going on? And I stopped because, you know, it wasn't... I wasn't worried where I came in the race. And I said, what's happening? He says, no, I felt like some mulberries. So I thought I'd stop and have some mulberries. Well, I eventually I carried on and he ended up coming somewhere right near the back because he eventually resumed the race. He had got distracted. He had lost keeping his eyes on the prize. And he had lost out winning the race. Joshua wants to say to God's people, keep your eyes on the prize. Don't become distracted in your race. The Apostle Paul, towards the end of his life, is able to write in 2 Timothy 4.8, I have run the race. I have kept the faith. I have uh, remained in the fight. Now my prize is heavenward. In other words, the Apostle Paul was able to say, I haven't lost sight of the prize. I've kept running this race because you and I are in a race. And Joshua would remind us this evening that this race is a long race. It is a race of endurance. And there are so many distractions along the way, aren't there? There are so many things that can lead us down paths that are unhelpful in our Christian life. And Joshua would remind us this evening, and God would remind us this evening, that we must not lose sight of the prize. We are moving towards eternity, and we must keep that vision in front of us, lest we allow the world to creep in and distract us and to cause us to be drawn aside and go down paths that are not helpful to us, that are full of potholes. They may seem attractive at the time. I remember when he finally got to the end of the race, he felt sick because he had eaten too many mulberries. And mulberries and running don't go well together. They just don't. It might have seemed attractive at the time, but at the end of the day, it didn't, be it didn't benefit him in the race that he was running. So God would remind us this evening, believers must be devoted to him, must keep their eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, must not be distracted to the left or to the right must run the race with perseverance. Firstly, I want you to notice the promise of Yahweh's help. 
See, God doesn't just leave us to do these things on our own. I think it's very easy for us as Christians to think it's all up to us and we've got to make this great effort and you do need to make an effort. It's not that we let go and let God kind of theology. It just doesn't work like that. There is a, a corresponding response for us to ensure that we are, with all of our strength, seeking to serve God. But we recognize, as the Apostle Paul did, when he said, no, I've worked harder than all of them, but not I, the grace of God in me. And it's as we strive to serve God, as we strive to run the race, that God in His grace comes alongside us and God enables us by His grace to run the race. And it's getting that balance right. And so Joshua reminds them of the promise of Yahweh's house, of help. Look at verses 1 to 5. After a long time had passed, and Yahweh had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, uh, Joshua, by then old and wide advanced in years, summoned all of Israel, the elders, leaders, the judges, and officials, and said to them, I am old and well advanced in years. You have seen everything Yahweh your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was Yahweh your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the lands of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Great Sea in the West. Yahweh, your God himself, will drive them out of your way. He will push them out before you, and you will take possession of the land as Yahweh, your God, has promised you. Now, before Joshua focuses on how God will help the people, he reminds them of God's faithfulness in the past. And it's as a result of reflecting on what God has done for them in the past that will propel them to move forward in the future. If they can look to the God who has equipped and strengthened and enabled them to conquer this land where there were enemies that at times created great fear amongst the surrounding nations and even amongst the Israelites, then they will be encouraged to know that there is no issue or no problem too big that God cannot enable them to overcome. And what does God remind them? He reminds them that He has fulfilled all of His promises. Thus they enjoy rest. And he wants to make three things abundantly clear in what God has done in the past. Number one is God has given them a land. And in giving them that land, what Joshua is at pains to emphasize is that they cannot take any pride in thinking that somehow it is through their accomplishments that they are now enjoying the fruit of the land. No, it is a result of God's faithfulness to his promises. God promised them a land. He promised it way back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And they are now the recipients of God's promises. It is God who has strengthened them to fight their enemies. And so Joshua mentions later on in the account how God defeated a nation and defeated thousands and how God has enabled them to take hold of that land. God's strength is what encourages them to know that they can face the future. Secondly, he wants them to know that God is always faithful to his promises. God keeps his promise. He is a covenant-keeping God. And it's important for us to remember that because I think it's very easy for us to somehow think that God's promises are for other people. And yet God reminds us, no, that the promises are for us and that God will fulfill every promise. One of the things that I've had to deal with as a pastor is those who die. And so often, they, as they near the gates that are going to open up for them into eternity, sometimes it's Satan's last chance to have a throw at them. And sometimes great insecurity begins to set in. And so I'm able to read and remind them that their salvation is secure because God is faithful to his promise. And God will not let them down. He refers to the allotment of the land, how God will help them to drive out the nations, how God will help them to clean up what remains. Now there is a sense in which overall the land has been taken. And so Israel occupy, occupy the land in a general sense. However, there are still some pockets here and there that need to be sorted out. 
And you remember that previously in Joshua, God has said to them, the reason why he hasn't driven out all of the nations in one shot and one foul swoop is because then wild animals would come in and occupy the land. So it's bit by bit that God has enabled them to occupy the land in order that they are not overwhelmed by animals that might come in and create chaos before they are able to take charge of the land. And what God wants to reassure Israel is that they will drive out the nations that remain in the land. It is going to require that Israel are faithful to God. But God will fulfill his promises to them. Thirdly, God gave them rest. God gave them rest. That is a fulfillment of what he said to them. They were under slavery in Egypt. They were experiencing difficulties. And now they are enjoying a land where they are free from the yoke of another nation. They are now, have now come under the sovereign kingship of God. And it is God who rules over them. And there is freedom and rest in the rule of God. There is contentment under his rule. There is great blessing that flows from God's throne in the land. And they are able to rest from their enemies if they are living in obedience to God. And Yahweh said to them that they would enjoy rest in the land if they would faithfully submit to God's commands. And so they are able to enjoy a permanent home, a home where they can put down roots, a home where they can cultivate crops, a home where they can raise families a place when they can have fellowship together, a place where they can come together and worship God. And that land of rest is contingent upon what? It is contingent upon Israel's faithfulness to continue to obey and live according to God's statutes. If they persevere, they will enjoy rest if they turn away from God. God has threatened them and said to them, he will drive them out the land. And that rest they enjoy is pointing forward to a much greater rest that you and I as God's people will enjoy one day. But the same contingency remains. The writer to the Hebrews puts it like this. Let me read from Hebrews because I think it's such a significant book when we think about what lies ahead. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, now hear this because here the author to the Hebrews is writing and saying that if Israel had entered final rest, there wouldn't be a rest yet to enter. But since Israel's rest was simply pointing forward to another rest, an eternal rest that God's people would enter into, Israel's rest was never final. It was simply a pointer forward. Now, here the author to the Hebrews. Therefore, since the promise of entering rest still stands, this is hundreds of years, thousands of years down the line, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Do you hear those words? For we have also had the gospel preached to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them. Why? Because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Now we, have, we, we who have believed enter that rest, just as God said, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere, I love the way the author puts it, he can't remember where. So he says, for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from his work. It still remains that some will enter that rest. And those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in it because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, today if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. 
For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Now you may be sitting here saying, what on earth is, is the author saying? The author is reminding us that when you think of the nation of Israel, many of them fell in the desert and never entered into the rest of the land. Joshua leads a new generation into the land. But he's reminding them that that rest is not final rest. It points forward to another rest. And the way in which you and I are able to enjoy that rest, that Sabbath rest, when we will rest with God in eternity one day, is to ensure that we persevere in our relationship with God. Because the same danger that faces them faces you and I. And that danger is disobedience. That danger is that we walk away from God. That danger is we forsake God. That danger is that we start off as they did, start off well, but somewhere down the line we get distracted. Eugene Peterson has written a book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. That's what it is. Obedience is never predicated upon a short-term sense of obeying God. But it is a lifetime of obeying God, a lifetime of persevering. And it's not that your salvation is brought under threat in any sense. It's not that you can lose your salvation. But one of the evidences of salvation is perseverance. And so we see those who are truly saved by the fact that up until the day that God calls them home, they persevere. They keep on keeping on. They don't walk away from God. They don't end up in rebellion to God. And so there is a reminder here that if you are going to enjoy eternal rest, it requires that you keep persevering in your faith, that you don't give up. And the reason that you are able to persevere is because God in His grace empowers you by His strength to persevere even when, at times, you face tremendous difficulties in your walk with the Lord. Your perseverance is fueled by God's amazing grace. You are not left to your own. You don't have to fight battles by yourself. You are not left to do all the striving that you have to drum up in yourself. But you are empowered by Almighty God. And those who are truly in a relationship with God truly persevere because it is by God's grace that they continue in their faith. Secondly, I want you to notice the challenge of God's word, the challenge of Yahweh's word. Look at verses 6 to 13. Challenge of Yahweh's word. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you must hold fast to Yahweh your God as you have until now. Now hear those words God is saying to the nation Israel. Be careful. That means literally to guard, to observe, to give heed, to celebrate, to obey. And then he says obey, which means to, uh, again, those two words combined, means that we do God's word, we hear God's word. And so there is a corresponding action. God's word is never just something that is stuffed into our head, but is something that is practically worked out on a daily basis. Obedience is always something that is evident by action. It's never just about saying, I know what God says and I have God's word stored in me, though that is important, but it is about working out one's faith because true faith is faith expressed. 
And the sense, therefore, here is that the law needs to be carefully applied and carefully observed. Do not turn to the left or to the right. We don't have the room to be able to question whether God's wisdom in what is revealed in his word is good or not good. We don't get into a debate with God about which commands we will follow and which parts of God's word we'll observe and which parts we're going to throw out. All of Scripture, from Genesis through to Revelation, is God's word and all of it is to be obeyed. Now the reality is that sometimes we look at obedience as something difficult. But Jesus said God's commands are not burdensome. They're not difficult, and when we come to realize and understand that our obedience actually brings freedom, the royal law, says James, that brings freedom, it actually frees us up to be who God has commanded us to be. It actually enables us to enjoy life the way God intended for us to enjoy life. Obedience is never some slavish thing that we do because we feel guilty or some preacher has spoken about obedience to God's word. But there is a sense of freedom that comes with it and a sense of deep inner contentment and joy that arises out of our obedience. And we find in obeying God that we get to experience the fullness of life that Jesus Christ has come to give. And so when you're faced with this challenge of obeying God or succumbing to the temptations that confront you. And let's be honest about it, we are confronted with temptations to walk away from God's commands every single day. Remember that in submission to the obedience to Christ, you are fulfilling how, what God has created you to be and you will find great pleasure and contentment in your obedience. Jesus, after all, reminds us if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Obedience is always something that is going to bring great contentment to the believer. And we should never view it as something difficult. And we should never view it as something debatable. How often do you get into a debate with God about what is right and what is wrong? And how often do we sometimes look at the world who are doing things that seem to bring great pleasure that we are forbidden from doing and think to ourselves somehow we are missing out? There's a wonderful story that I read recently uh, of a man who came down from uh, the mountains in North Carolina in America. He was all dressed up and carrying his Bible under his arm. A friend saw him and asked, Elias, What's happening? Where are you going all dressed up like that? And Lai said, I've heard about New Orleans. I hear there is a lot of free running liquor and lots of gambling and a lot of real good naughty shows. The friend looked him over and said, but Elias, why are you carrying a Bible under your arm? And Elias replied, well, if it's as good as they say it is, I might stay over until Sunday. Now, sometimes that's our contradiction, isn't it? Sometimes that's our dilemma, isn't it? We've got the Bible under one arm, and we've got Satan in the other arm. And they've got, if you like, that good and bad angel speaking to us. And the temptations come thick and fast, and Satan knows our weaknesses and preys on those weaknesses, which is why it becomes so imperative that if we are going to obey God, our motivations for obedience must be right. If we are motivated out of a sense of guilt or obligation, then obedience is going to become slavish and it's going to be bound up with a legalism that only kills the spirit and brings death, not life. Our obedience must be motivated by love. Notice what Joshua says when he writes, but you are to hold fast to Yahweh your God until the Lord has driven them out before you to this day. Um, he goes on to say, let me just find the right verse. Um, now I've lost my place. 
But he talks about the Lord uh, loving the Lord your God. So that, there, there we go, verse 11. So be very careful to love Yahweh your God. Do you hear that? Why does he say that? Because he recognizes that if the Israelites are going to obey God, the best way in which they will obey God will arise out of their love for God. It is their love that will drive them to obedience. If their love begins to wane, and if their love is not being fueled and not growing for God, then compromise will set in, and they will be distracted and led astray. And often in our relationship with God, when our love begins to grow cold, we are at our most vulnerable, are we not? And you know, the thing is, you can't generate love for God on your own strength. You just can't. And you can't convince yourself to love God by repeating over and over, I must love God, I must love God. It just doesn't work like that. How do we grow in our love of God? Well, let me ask you this. When you are in a relationship with someone you love, how do you grow to love that person more and more? You grow to love that person by coming to know them more and more. And you come to love that person by seeing the excellence of the qualities in them. And when we come to know God more, when we read the Word of God, and when we come to understand the character of God, when we come to understand the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, so our love for him will deepen and grow. And it is only through the hard work of work in the word that you and I will grow in the grace and knowledge and in the love of Jesus. The more we know him, the more we love him. And the more we love him, the more we will serve him. And the more we will sacrifice ourselves to him. And the more we will deny because our desire will be an overwhelming desire to want to please him. And so that's why you see that when Joshua says to him, do not be careful, do not depart from the word uh, Lord, do not turn to the left or to the right, how important God's word plays in the life of the believer. If your Bible is gathering dust, you have a problem. If your Bible is something that you read through superficially, you have a problem. It is our responsibility to open the Word, to read it carefully, to meditate upon it, and to allow it to infiltrate into the depths of our soul. And as the Lord Jesus Christ reveals more and more of his majesty and his beauty and the excellence of his character, so we will grow to love him more and more and more. And as we grow to love him, we will desire to please him. Is that not true in a relationship? The last thing you want to do to someone you really love is to hurt them. Those who are deeply in love want to do things that will express their love towards the other person. And the same is true in our relationship with Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's the most fundamental commandment of them all. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. How do you love Jesus? And then he says, if you love God and if you are careful to obey the law, what are one of the expressions of that? It is that you will avoid being polluted by the world. Not everything that glitters is gold. We get so seduced by the world, so drawn into what glitters. And sometimes we get so distracted by the world and we get so easily led astray by it. It offers us so many pleasures. And some of those things are good things. They come from God. And so we mustn't simply dismiss it as all bad. 
But when we allow the world to become the preoccupation of our, our souls and the preoccupation of what we do, and when entertainment becomes more important than God, and we get involved in all kinds of things to entertain us, and our recreational lives take on a, a greater importance than our life and our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're being distracted by the world. We're being led astray into the ways of the world. And we must be careful that we don't allow ourselves to be drawn into the, the deception of the world because the devil will come to you and say, this is going to benefit you in some way. You're going to get some kind of pleasure out of this. But the world is only hollow in all of its pleasures that it offers. Only Jesus brings contentment. Do not even associate with them. Why? Because Joshua knows and God knows that when you begin to associate with the world, soon it will suck you in, and soon it will become irresistible to you, and soon you will be so caught up in the world that you won't even know that you've become worldly. And so he says, don't associate with it. Don't go there. Now, if this is not just the Old Testament, listen to what the New Testament says. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. How is my mind renewed? It's renewed in the Word of God. It's renewed in the things of God. Paul, writing to the Philippians, says, think on all that is good. Think on these things, all that is lovely, all that is pure, all that is good. Let your mind dwell there. then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You cannot love the world and love God at this equally at the same time. Either you love God or you love the world. There is no middle option. There is no one foot in this camp and one foot in that camp. For everything from in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. And then young people, hear this. 2 Corinthians 6.14 Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with God? Darkness. Here is an explicit command. This is not an option or extra in which we get into a debate with God and say, but Lord, I'm single, and Lord, I, I so desire to be married, and Lord, someone else come along, and they're such a nice person, and, and they really, I've really clicked with them, and I really get on so well with them, and, and we have such good conversations, and we enjoy each other, but they're not saved, Lord. Surely you can make an exception. God says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. There are no exceptions. There is no such thing, and hear this, there is no such thing as evangelism dating. It's not part of God's economy. And so either you obey God or you obey self. You have to make a choice. Either your own desires overwhelm, and either you respond to your own self-centeredness, or you become other-centered and respond to God's word and God's commands. But you can't have it both ways. There is no bits and pieces with God. Either you are devoted to Him or you are devoted to you. Oswald Chambers. If you haven't read Oswald Chambers, you need to read Oswald Chambers. I still would argue that the finest devotional book ever written is by Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest. You can do that year after year and still not plummet the depths. Oswald Chambers in his book, Highest Good, said, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else, whereas when you do not fear God, you fear everything else. 
Who do I fear more? The rebuke of friends? And, or do you fear God more than anything else so that the fear of God draws me to obey? True devotion to God expresses itself in obedience. The only way to enjoy true happiness and contentment as a believer is to be living in obedience to God, an obedience that is motivated, grounded in the amazing love of God. Where do we see this love reach its zenith? Romans 5, 6 tells us, God demonstrates his love in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the midst of our rebellion, in the midst of our shaking our fist in the face of Almighty God, God responds by sending His Son into the world to suffer a cruel death on a cross as an expression of love that is so radical, it's impossible to process it all, which is why when Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 19 following, he prays that the Ephesians may come to grasp more and more the love of God, that love that is too deep to grasp in all its dimensions. And that love is seen through the Lord Jesus Christ dying on a cross for people who hate him. Thirdly, I want you to notice the certainty of Yahweh's judgment. Verses 14 to 16, the certainty of Yahweh's judgment. Now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul and not, that not one of all the good promises of Yahweh your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as every good promise of Yahweh your God has come true, so Yahweh will bring on you all the evil he has threatened until he has destroyed you from this good land he has given you. If you violate the covenant of Yahweh your God, which he has commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, Yahweh's anger will burn against you and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. Now when we think of idols, please don't think in terms of necessarily having an object in the house that you bow down and worship. An idol is anything that draws you away from God. And our idols are sometimes intangible idols. Sometimes pleasure becomes an idol. Sometimes entertainment becomes an idol. Sometimes our free time becomes an idol. Sometimes our TV becomes the idol. Sometimes sport becomes an idol. Sometimes our husband or wife becomes an idol. Sometimes our children become idols in our lives. We need to understand that idolatry is anything that would divert our attention of Jesus Christ and divert our attention onto the thing that takes more and demands more of us than what we give to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the moment we are being distracted from the priority of relationship with Jesus, we are worshiping idols. And it's easy to stand in condemnation of Israel from a distance and say, yeah, look at Israel. I mean, they just walked away from God and they got involved in the surrounding nations and they ended up having to experience the judgment of God because of their failure to obey the promises and their failure to obey the commands of God. But we're not like that. Really? What kind of arrogance is that? Our idols may be different. Our idols may take the form of materialism, may take the form of pride, may take the form of image, may take the form of respectability, but they're idols nevertheless. And it's very easy for us to allow ourselves to be drawn into idolatry. And the antidote to idolatry is to love Jesus. Because if you love him more, then what you love, anything else, then he will become the center of your being. Then he will become the focus of your devotion. Then he will become the priority in your life. And everything will be structured and revolve around him. And God says to his people, if you do not heed my commands, I will move in judgment against you. What does Israel's history teach us? The northern kingdom invaded, 722. Assyria came down, wiped them out, gone. Ten tribes, 
gone, never to be reconstituted, gone. 587, 586 BC, the Babylonians came up and they took out the remaining two tribes, took them away into captivity. They experienced all that God said they would experience if they failed to obey him. 70 years later, God brought the nation back into the land. Now, God's judgment is never meant simply to be a punishment against sin. It is that, make no mistake. But it is there to cause us to repent. It is there to cause us to turn away from our sin. It is there to draw us back into relationship with God. It is given against us so that we might once again be restored to God. And so the author to the Hebrews in chapter 12 talks about how God disciplines these people because he loves them. And he can't just let them do their own thing and turn a blind eye and pretend it's all okay. He must bring them back to himself. And so sometimes he acts against them in order that they may be restored in relationship with him. And sometimes God's discipline comes even more broadly than that. That God's judgment comes upon the world in certain respects because God commands all people everywhere to repent. And at the end of the day, all people are created by God. And all people have an obligation to worship God. And those who turn away from God can't expect God simply to, to carry on pretending that all is okay and all is well when it's not. There's a great article, go to the Gospel Coalition site, can I encourage you to do that? Christopher Ash has written a great article on what we should learn from the COVID pandemic. And one of the things he said we need to learn from this COVID pandemic is that it is a sign of God's judgment. It is a sign of God's future judgment. We get these signs that God brings to us to remind us there is a judgment to come. And they come in order to send us towards Him and to remind us to repent. But so often we harden our hearts. And so often we fail to repent. And so often we keep walking along the paths that lead to destruction. When 9-11 happened, there was a flood in churches. How long did it last? As soon as the effects of 9-11 were over, people disappeared again. These things happen so that God reminds us there is a future judgment to come. And it is His desire that we should repent. God desires that all should come to repentance and faith without distinction. And so God says to Joshua, just remind these people, if they don't obey me, there are going to be consequences. And somehow we think as believers we are immune from that. But God sometimes disciplines us as his people, rightly so, in order that we might come back into fellowship and communion with him, in order that we might once again experience the joy of, of his salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the temporal judgments that sometimes we experience in this world are a reminder that future judgment awaits and that God is coming to judge the world in righteousness and truth. And so as God's people we do not fear that because we are right with God, but we do need to tell others about God's judgment, as difficult a subject as it is, lest they experience it for all eternity because no one's spoken. No one said anything. So let me ask you, are you keeping your eyes on the prize? Are you living your life in devotion to God because you love Jesus? Is your love for the Lord Jesus Christ growing and growing and growing? Are you more in love with Jesus today than you were yesterday? Are you more in love with Jesus today than you were when you were first converted? Has the, is the passion 
for knowing Christ and ongoing increasing emotion in your life? Does that passion drive you to the feet of Christ? Have you become so enthralled with Jesus that you want to know more and more and nothing satisfies you but knowing Christ? Does not Paul write that I've forgotten all things, I consider all things lost, but for the surpassing sake, a greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things, I count them rubbish, that I might know Christ. Is that your overwhelming passion of the soul? Sometimes our Christianity is frustrated and our faith is frustrated because we get distracted by the world. Don't be deceived. Satan is the arch deceiver. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning a chain. Shame and is now exalted and seated at the right hand of God. Keep your eye on the prize. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we have such a glorious Savior in the Lord Jesus Christ. Such a wonderful Savior. We confess, O oh God, that it's so easy to get distracted. There are so many, so many things in the world that lure us and tempt us, that promise us so much but deliver so little. Forgive us where we have got distracted. Forgive us where we have walked down paths that are not helpful. Forgive us where we have lost our passion for Jesus. Forgive us where our love has grown cold, O oh God. We want to love you more. So help us to grow in our love, fuel our passion for Jesus. And when those distractions come as they inevitably will, and when temptations assail us, help us not to buy into their deception. Help us to recognize them for what they are and help us to flee from them and help us to flee to the cross. I pray that for every person here who knows you, that you would enable them to grow in their walk with you so that they would come to know you more deeply each day and come to love you more passionately and come to serve you more faithfully. And if there be any here who do not know you, oh God, rescue them. Show them the wonder and beauty of Jesus. Overwhelm them with who you are, that they will be driven to the cross and do it for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and his sake alone. Amen. Won't you join me as we're going to stand and sing our closing song, Lord.